Welcome to the third episode of DFW Sports United in Action, a roadmap for change. My name is Megan Eisenhard, and I am the Vice President of WISE, that's Women in Sports and Events here in DFW. Um, as we wrap up Hispanic Heritage Month, we are proud to collaborate with BSP North Texas and with DISE um, to bring change in action for a more diverse, equitable and inclusive sports industry, especially here in the DFW area. These virtual events are free, as most of you know by now. Um, and our last event of this year is going to happen in two weeks from today on October 28th, so mark your calendars. Additionally, all three groups have worked very hard to put together a new website that will have links to all of our webinars, as well as all of the blueprint for action items. So you can check us out at dfwsportsunitedinaction.com and I think it's going to be on the chat so if you want to check that out um, you can link to it when you want. Um, so I'm so excited today to be here and to introduce some of our guests. Um, so when I was doing my master's program at Cal, Go Bears, uh, I did a ton of research on sports and college sports and the name that came up repeatedly was Dr. Richard Lapchik. And so I just, it's, it's an honor to be here today and actually see him in person and to um, have and to listen to him and what he's going to say to you all today. And additionally, Dr. Lewis Johnson um, has been on the television screen for over 25 years. Um, I know I've seen him on so many historic events around the world. He's also working for the Pac-12 Network, so I get to see him when I see my Cal Bears play. And um, people in Texas do watch the Pac-12 Network. Just want to throw that out there. <laughs> um, but he is a true master of his craft, and we're really excited to have him moderate um, the discussion today. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to my friend and colleague, Brian Dennis, with BSP North Texas to say a few remarks. Well, thank you, Megan. As a proud supporter of WISE and a proud board member of DICE and BSP, it is a great pleasure to bring this great speaker to our stage. When we think about diversity, you want to keep in mind, diversity is every day in everything that we do. I'll be remiss if I did not think about the National Disability Employment Awareness Month is in October. So before we turn it over to the great speakers and moderator today, please keep in mind any questions, comments, concerns, please send those down in the chat box. You'll see it below. But I'm going to turn it over to the president of DICE and my twin, Mr. Kern. <laughs> Take it away, Kern. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Brian, I couldn't agree more. Two guys with faces for radio, uh, definitely not webinars. <laughs> Um, today, we have the pleasure of joining what I know will be an impactful discussion on racial equity, not only in sports, uh, but beyond. I I've got to tell you, a career highlight for me was spending the day with Dr. Lapchik back in July of last year uh, when he joined us for our first DEI event. Well, that day now feels like a decade ago. The impact it had on me is going to last forever. Uh, he's a legend in his unwavering fight for equality, and I'm grateful he agreed to join us today. Thankfully, we have someone who's much more qualified than I to guide this discussion with Dr. Lapchik, and that's Dr. Lewis Johnson. As uh, Megan mentioned, Lewis has over 25 years of sports broadcasting experience, 10 Olympic Games, three Paralympic Games, the NBA, March Madness, college football, the New York City Marathon. The list goes on and on. Not only do we get to see him on TV, Lewis also finds time to be a red carpet host, voiceover artist, podcast host, vent MC charity golf fundraiser and his own media and training company on top of all of that. He's not only a world traveler, he's also a world-class human uh, and I'm really happy that he's agreed to join us today and I am happy to now pass it off to you, Lewis. Karen, thank you so much and you guys not only have a face for television but the voices and of course the storytelling and important things that you guys are doing. So thank you so much for having me today. It is an absolutely an honor. And I want to welcome everybody who has joined us for this afternoon to have this important discussion to listen to Dr. Lapchik. We're ex excited to, uh, to have him here. And listen, I'm honored to be here as well to discuss these important issues and how we can all be a part of the change, which is what we're talking about today. And we're fortunate to speak to Dr. Lapchik now because he just released his latest racial and gender report card. That was just over a month ago. So we want to make sure that later after this uh, webinar is finished, you go and hit the link and go and read some of what he has published, uh, many years of doing that. Uh, we'll talk today about the report card and how that has spurred real change in the evolution of the sports industry uh, with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion in sports, all important topics for everyone on today. And we'll also discuss uh, the action items, things we need to do that individuals can take uh, to hold our organizations 
our communities and of course our industries accountable uh, and continue to make real change and real progress. That's what we want to do today. So with that, let me say hello to Dr. Lapchik. How are you today? Dr. Lapchik, are you there? Oh, so I'm so sorry. That's okay. What happens okay. when you turn 75? No, no, no. Listen, <laughs> I, think, I think you are a veteran of these things, so no worries at all. How are you today? I'm really good. I'm very happy to be here. I really enjoyed it when I was there last year. Uh, it was a great experience. It was a great audience. Being with Kern and Larry and everybody else was uh, a real treat for me. Well, this is a real treat for us. And I can tell you for somebody who's been in the business for a long time, it is really an honor to speak with you and help to navigate this conversation. So let's get into it. Um, your upbringing and your experiences have led you to really years of work in the fight for diversity in our industry. And let me begin by asking you, how have things changed in progress or not over the years? What do you see? Well, it began a long time ago for me. Literally, when I was five years old, I looked outside my bedroom window and saw my father's image swinging from a tree with people under the tree picketing. Mm -hmm. And for several years after that, I picked up the extension phone in our house, my dad not knowing I was listening, and it was racial epithet after racial epithet being hurled at him. As a five, six, and seven-year-old, I had no idea what any of it was about, except that I knew that a lot of people hated this man that was my best friend. Mm. Later in life, I would find out that as the coach of the New York Knicks, he had signed the first African-American player in the history of the NBA, Nat Sweetwater Clifton, a week before the NBA draft that year when Boston Celtics drafted Chuck Cooper and the Washington Nationals drafted Earl Lloyd and together they became the first three African-American players to play in the NBA. We just finished watching the NBA finals recently and it's a league that's now nearly 80% black. Uh, but in 1950, people weren't ready to even see one, two or three blacks in the league or some people right. weren't at least. Uh, I grew up as my father's son, who my father was a basketball hall of famer and two times as a player and a coach. Everybody told me I was gonna follow in his footsteps. I certainly liked that image. So I played hard, as hard as I could. I, he was the first grade big man in basketball. I was six feet tall in the eighth grade and was pretty heavily recruited in the New York City area, including by a school called Power Memorial High School, which was the top basketball program in the country, along with DeMatha in Washington. Didn't go there, but uh, became friends with the coach and the coach asked me uh, to come to his summer camp in 1961. In 1961, uh, you may know that no high school coaches had summer basketball camps. Very few college coaches even had them. Now they're huge revenue sources for coaches, but in 1961, it was almost unheard of. So the coach brought five of his, six of his players, five of them were white, one of them was black. One of the white guys who's been a D1 coach for the last 35 years was hurling the N-word at the black guy for the first three days until I finally challenged him. He literally knocked me out cold. Oh. And then uh, it turned out the next day when uh, my friend, the black guy discovered it, uh, a lifelong friendship began. I talk about uh, a leader being somebody who stands up for justice. And I now realize that that was probably the first time I did that in my life. The young man's name at the time was Lou Alcindor, became Kareem mm -hmm. Abdul-Jabbar. And that lifelong friendship has been a rich one for me. Uh, rich enough that he asked me to speak when his statue was unveiled at the Staples Center. I was his guest along with Henry Louis Gates when Barack Obama gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom at the White House in the last month of his administration. And I, when I was scheduled to have surgery in Orlando, which is where I live, Kareem flew from Los Angeles to be with me. But as a 15 year old white kid, what was so important to me then was that I suddenly had a young urban African-American lens to see what racism was doing to his community and other communities of color. And I decided as a 15 year old that I was gonna spend the rest of my life working in the area of civil rights. I didn't know what that meant as a 15 year old, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I ended up going to get a PhD in international race relations. It was the first one in the country. The degree had literally just been created a couple of years be before and I was the first student in it. And I did my doctoral dissertation on how South Africa used sport as part of its foreign policy and the international response and compared it to how the Nazis had done that in the 1930s. Uh, it got published as a book. I started speaking about apartheid in the early 1970s. I founded the Sports Boycott of South Africa for your listeners uh, who, and viewers who don't know. 
Apartheid was the most racist system of government on the face of the earth in the second half of the 20th century. If you were a person of color and 81% of the people were, you couldn't own land, you couldn't vote, you couldn't send your children to the school you wanted to, you couldn't live where you wanted to, you were there to serve a very wealthy white economy. Only time in peacetime history that the global community came together to try to strangle a regime. There was a bank loan boycott, a trade boycott, a currency boycott, and a sports boycott. You could smuggle in currency, you could smuggle in oil, you could smuggle in trade, but you couldn't play sports in the dark. South Africa was a sports loving country like so many are, and the, the sports boycott became its Achilles heel. The European countries stopped playing with South Africa. The only countries left were New Zealand, Australia, Britain, and the United States. And a team was coming to the United States in 1978. It was the first team to come here. It was a Davis Cup team. They were gonna play in Nashville, Tennessee in the North American zone of the Davis Cup. I flew to Nashville to try to build the protest against it, uh, spoke in various audiences over the course of the weekend. I was working closely with the African governments who asked me to announce that they would boycott the 1984 Olympic, Olympic Games in LA if this team was allowed to come. So we leaked that to the press. We had a press conference before that final speech. All three networks were there and Dick Schapp, who was covering for NBC Nightly News, came up to me at, and said, the financial backers of the Davis Cup had pulled out. It looked like the matches were gonna be canceled. I announced that to the crowd. It was an anti-apartheid crowd. They went crazy. And when I flew home to Virginia that night, Lewis, I thought maybe for the first time in my life I had done something worthwhile. Mm. The next night I was working late in my college office. My office was in the school's library. The library closed at 10.30 at 10.45. There was a knock on the door. I assumed it was the campus security who would routinely check if they saw a light on after the building was closed. But instead, it was two men wearing stocking masks who proceeded to cause liver damage, kidney damage, a hernia, concussion, and carved the N-word in my stomach with a pair of office scissors. That night, laying in the hospital, I knew that if people had gone to the length they had gone to to try to stop my father 28 years before, and to the length they went to that night to try to stop me, that they must have thought that we were being effective in combating racism by using the sports platform to address racism in America. And I decided that night that I would spend the rest of my life using that sports platform in various forms uh, to fight against racism and other forms of discrimination in, in this country. Uh, and that's how it all started. But to bring it to today, as you said, um, you know, I hear so many black leaders and black people uh, say that they think white people are listening more in this racial uh, reckoning period. And I think that that's true. Uh, but one of the things that makes my story, I think, relevant today as well as when it actually was happening, was that so many people came up to me in 1978 and said, now you know what it's like to be black. Mm. My response to them then and my response to them now, and my response to everybody who wants to be an ally in this struggle is I didn't know what, what it was like to be black. I couldn't know what it was like to be black. Yeah. I could have walked away at any particular moment during the last 42 years from the struggle and resumed a comfortable middle-class white life, never faced discrimination, never faced the possibility of violence again. But if I was black, I'd wake up black the next day and I would face discrimination or the possibility of violence that day and every day after that for the rest of my life. Hopefully it would never happen to me, but there's always that possibility. I could never know completely what it was like to be black. And I think white people are today knew something about racism but they didn't really understand what it meant on a personal level to be victimized by racism. And I think they're listening and I think that's changing uh, the part of the, the, the future as we head forward. And I think, you know, having the millennials and generation Z are two generations that are much more uh, socially convicted and, and committed to social justice than previous generations. Lewis, they've got the technology that we didn't have. We saw things during the civil rights era that were horrifying when they somehow were reported on the news, but so many weren't reported on the news. Or if, a, if there was a police shooting at a particular time, uh, all the police had to do was say, we were, uh, we were fighting in self-defense against whoever was, was killed in that shooting. But we have to remember that not only have these murders taken place this year, but in 2019, there were 27 days in the United States when a policeman or a policewoman did not shoot and kill a citizen of their community. Now, many of those were actually in the line of duty, but obviously a lot of them weren't. And 54% of the people who were killed 
for people of color, more than double their percentage in the population. So police brutality, you know, has been with us for so long, but these generations can now capture that uh, with their smartphones and spread it through social media in ways that we couldn't. And of course, we're a sports community gathered here today. And I think the final ingredient that makes me hopeful that this is gonna be different this time, that we can sustain this, is athlete activism. Four years ago when Colin Kaepernick took a knee, I think the, the uh, national community generally of sports fans disapproved of it. The Nielsen study on racism in sports fans that was taken three weeks ago showed that 75% of sports fans in America support athlete activism, 76% support their teams helping athletes to show their activism, and a similar percentage wanted their brands to be engaged in social justice efforts. This is a huge shift in public opinion that I think is sustainable. And I apologize for that long-winded answer, but you have to understand that I am a professor. You are, and there is no apology needed because that nugget right there, that answer, we could end the webinar right here, everybody. Is that right? And we will have gained some knowledge and information from a lifetime of experience that is just unmatchable. As I move to the next question, I have to share that this important uh, element of sport and how it can be so important. When I think about the Olympic Games and the last games in Rio, Wade Van Niekerk, a South African athlete in lane eight in the 400 meter final, broke the world record, coached by a white South African grandmother. And Wade won the gold, broke Michael Johnson's world record. And the irony of it all is his mom, who was a great athlete, was not allowed to compete and fulfill her dreams because she was because of apartheid. So the sports platform, we have a tremendous opportunity to forward uh, justice and stand for it. And your last answer about this is critically important. Uh, just remembering that, uh, thinking about the Olympics and how magnificent that platform, but how important it is to not just sport, but also to social justice uh, locally, domestically, and globally. Um, let me move on to the next question. I think that uh, people want to hear about this. Uh, you, listen, you've been a fierce advocate uh, for allyship and change, and you actually came up with the Racial Gender Sports Report card, all of that based on that incredible uh, history of your life that you just uh, talked about. And you do that, of course, to monitor sports leagues and organizations. Can you briefly explain to everybody watching today, what's the methodology, doctor, that you use to develop the report card? First of all, I did it as part of a book uh, that was written about this period of time in my life. When the book was published, the Sports Illustrated reviewer was very critical of of what I wrote about this kernel of information about hiring practices in professional sport. And his perspective is, why is this guy bringing up things of the past? Sports are completely integrated. He, of course, was talking about the playing fields, which were mostly integrated by that time in 1984. Uh, but I was so angry that um, he took that point of view about that particular part of the book that I decided to do these racial and gender report cards on a regular basis. Uh, and, and we started in 1988, by, and then it was a report card of the NFL, Major League Baseball, and the NBA. It's obviously expanded to include other professional sports, college sports, the sports media. Uh, during the racial reckoning, we've been approached for the first time. People are asking us to do racial and gender report cards. So we're gonna have a NASCAR racial and gender report card, an NHL racial and gender report card. It was recently announced at the West Coast Conference uh, is doing the first conference report card. And I can tell you that I'm in conversations with four other conferences to do them. So the idea behind it, Lewis, to answer your question is to show how, not to show how bad, hopefully someday we'll be showing how good we are at hiring women and people of color, especially in leadership positions at the league level at pro sport, as well as at the team level. The leagues are doing pretty well, uh, but it's at the team level where the lag really takes place at the local level, particularly in senior decision-making positions. Uh, we're doing better in racial hiring practices, but we're doing worse in gender hiring practices. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sorry to report that the uh, gender grades have been progressively decreasing in every major pro sport as well as college sport for several years. And that's probably the most uh, di distressing part of what we've been reporting uh, in recent years. We have a long way to go on both, both sides of that equation, uh, but the report card is there to keep the pressure on to give the commissioners in these cases, who I think in the early days of the report card were resentful that I was doing it and didn't really want me to do it. They now use it as a tool with their teams uh, to try to get them to, you know, we don't want to get a C or even a B. I mean, I explained that, you know, in, in my graduate program and all graduate programs in the, 
in the country, if you get below a B, it's a failure. You can't get two Bs in our program and remain in the program. And that's true of graduate mm -hmm. programs in general. So when, we, when a, a sport gets a C, that's actually a failing grade in my book. Uh, yeah. Somebody else might read it differently. And that's why I explained that part of it. Uh, because we have a long way to go, especially in gender hiring practices. So this is really interesting to get a bit of this detail, uh, as you mentioned, because uh, your, your report card is used as that annual benchmark tool. For the benefit of our viewers today who are listening, let's dive even deeper if you can and talk about the key actions and changes that some of the teams and organizations have made, some of the things they may need to make. Can you be specific about those changes at, based on the report card? How are they using them and what are the actionable results that we're getting or you're getting? Well, over the years, you know, when we started, nobody had a, for lack of a better term, chief diversity and inclusion officer in the league office. Now they all have it. Seven NBA teams have chief diversity officers, usually at the SVP level. Um, other sports teams are, are in the process of hiring them in, in other leagues. And I think, you know, we're going to see this happen. I'd be surprised if almost every team didn't have such a, such a position at a senior level in, in the next couple of years. Uh, they, though, when, when those people were in place, uh, they made sure that um, hiring practices in the various departments that fell under them had actionable items that if that their performance was based on who they hire, who, who they included in a search for a job, and then who was hired in a job. But first of all, who was hired, who was in the search process to make sure there was a diverse pool of candidates. When, when we first started doing this, uh, you know, I, I went in 2002 with Cyrus Mary and, and Johnny Cochran to the NFL to threaten legal action if they didn't change their hiring practices and the Rooney Rule was resulted in the next year. And when it, when it first started, the rule was to have a diverse candidate in, in the room. We now realize that according to the studies most recently, that unless you have more than one diverse candidate, it's unlikely that you're gonna hire a diverse candidate uh, as a result of that process. So we, we're now recommending more than one diverse candidate uh, in that hiring pool. We're obviously not just talking about coaches, we're talking about all senior leadership positions. Uh, I was lucky enough and, and Larry Lundy was instrumental in, in my being able to do this. The favorite project I've ever done in terms of writing was co-authoring the autobiography of Eddie Robinson. And, you know, like so many other people, I revered him so much that when he passed, uh, we started pushing for a rule in the college space that we called the Eddie Robinson rule, named after coach, patterned on the Rooney rule. Um, so you have to have that in place, but ha have it for all, all senior positions, uh, have not only people of color, but women in, in, the, in the role for those positions. You know, we're going to have a woman head coach in the NBA, I don't have any doubt within a couple of years. Adam Silver's made that commitment. We have more than 10 uh, women coaching in the NFL uh, and, and in Major League Baseball now. Uh, this is all starting to, to bubble up. And, uh, and again, I think we're gonna see women in, in positions that we never expected to see them in before. Uh, oh, that's a man's position, the head coach or the manager. I don't think that's gonna be the case. The general manager, I think we're gonna be we're going to be hiring women in those positions as well very soon. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully so. So uh, you share some important stories and history of how the NFL has had to embrace the Rooney rule and then uh, the uh, collegiate uh, college football with the Eddie Robinson rule. Now for the people listening here today who are not involved with the NFL or, or college basketball or college football or what have you, how can uh, they use uh, something uh, from this discussion or these platforms or ideas, how can individuals and organizations use their own platforms to create changes in their own industry? Some of the basic things that you can, tenants you can apply across any industry. Be transparent in who you hire. Make your staff known to the staff at least. Doesn't have to be, you know, in the Dallas Morning News, but you know, if you work for X Corporation, make sure everybody in X Corporation knows who's in the positions of authority, who's you know, what, who holds all those positions, uh, you know, and sometimes it may surprise you. Sometimes if you go transparent, it'll break a stereotype that the staff might think, well, we're, we're really not diverse. And when they see the full picture, maybe they're more diverse than they thought. Usually that's not going to be the case, but it could be the case as well. You might find good, good news in, by, by doing that. But by being transparent, 
you're always going to be more appreciated by the people who work for you and work with you. They're going to trust you more. They're going to have faith in you more that you're trying to bring about change and have a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace. Very good. Um, I think something else that people will want to take away, a tangible resource or tool that they can use after this discussion to actually apply. So are there any particular tools or resources that you suggest uh, we can share with this broad audience to help them continue to be informed and, and make a difference uh, in the sports industry? Well, I mean, I think having somebody who has a, at a senior level of responsibility for that in, in the organization uh, to celebrate certain things. You know, I think we started to celebrate in the racial reckoning Juneteenth as a, as a holiday. Uh, I think corporations across America, including in your part of, part of the country, can sell, make that an actual day uh, to celebrate uh, black history, uh, to commemorate maybe some historical figures in the company that have been you know, the first black people hired in senior positions in the company to, you know, let other people know about them, what their history is, what their contributions were, uh, to get everybody involved. You know, we're facing in two and a half weeks now, the most important day in recent times in America to make your corporation, uh, give your people the opportunity to register to vote and then vote and to encourage them to vote, not only in the presidential election, which has so much at stake, but also in local elections. If you don't like the way things are being run in a particular police department, there are probably alternative candidates running for police chief or sheriff in your, in your locality that you might vote into office to begin the, the process of those changes. Uh, to pay attention, to, to read more about, uh, you know, what is going on in terms of racism locally and racism in, in America to have a better understanding and appreciation of it. Uh, to, to find a, to encourage your people to volunteer for anti-racist organizations in town that are nonprofits that need that help, uh, to volunteer your time, spend, spend time with them, helping them and achieve their missions, uh, perhaps to, to donate to them, to encourage your people that if some terrible thing is happening that needs to be stood up for, that if they wanna, they wanna be part of a protest, that there's gonna be no sanction for them to be among, for example, the 27 million people who took to the streets uh, since George Floyd was murdered this year, the largest mass movement in American history. Uh, that's another reason, and it's been a very, the most diverse group of people out in the streets than, than we've ever had before. Yeah. Those are all encouraging signs, but if our corporations locally and nationally encourage those things among their employees, we'll have a better workplace all the way around. Yeah, agreed. I believe that all those things will be better if we will apply those. Um, for those of you who are watching and with us, uh, we want to thank you again for being here for this webinar. This is a very important topic. And just so you know, um, the uh, Dr. Lapchick's 2020 Racial and Gender Report Card is there's a link provided for you in the chat, as well as some of the other things we talked about in terms of actionable steps. There's a link for that in the chat as well. Don't hit it now. Stay here with us, but you'll be able to get it later on and follow up uh, with some of the specific things we're talking about. If you could, Dr. Lapchick, just as we can get ready to take some questions, uh, we do have a broad North Texas audience. Is there uh, anything else in particular for this North Texas market that you might be able to um, uh, give them some pointers on in terms of those action steps? I think everything you've mentioned so far will work for anybody. Anything particular for the North Texas market? Well, I think... You know, you can set an example for the national audience. I think that, you know, we are a country that builds stereotypes. And I think there's outside of Texas, a stereotype of people in Texas being conservative generally and, and different parts of the, the Dallas area having a conservative bent to it. Uh, prove, prove them wrong. Go out and do things that show that you care about social justice. Uh, either in public displays or what you do in your corporations uh, or the stands that you uh, take in your community. Have them support efforts like you're doing here today. That is a snapshot in the sports world, but it's, it's you know, the sports world is a big world. We have so many sports fans uh, that make this, make them aware of, of what these three great organizations are doing here. Very good. Well, um, you have given us just an incredible amount of history and, and, and the blueprint for how companies, individuals, organizations, sports or otherwise can conduct themselves as they hopefully want to improve 
uh, these elements. So now let's take some questions, Dr. Lapchik. You ready for that? We'll get some I'll questions from some folks. Okay. Um, here's one from Valerie Johnson. She wants to know, what are your thoughts on golf? It's predominantly white. Uh, what needs to happen for that to change? So that's a general question. You know, you're talking about the players. Are you talking about administration, the PGA? Any thoughts on golf in general or specifically? Well, you know, I, I think when Tiger Woods was first successful, we expected to see, or many people expected to see, kind of the, the gates opening up and so many more black people at the highest levels. Um, you know, I think like with anything else, there has to be a grassroots pipeline created in, in youth sports. I actually spoke in Dallas many years ago at a First Tee event. First Tee, you, your members probably know, is a youth golf sports organization emphasizing black participation in golf. Uh, you know, they need resources. I mean, one of the, one of the things, as somebody who's been involved in fighting for racial justice for 50 years, the hardest thing that I've had to do as somebody who's been part of that, in addition to facing some of the th personal things that I faced that we spoke about earlier, is raising money. Mm. You know, anti-racist organizations are not well-funded. You know, if we make contributions to First Tee and other organizations that are trying to build that pipeline in golf or tennis, we could pick a whole range of sports here that blacks don't compete in very in, in large numbers uh, to support those youth organizations. Uh, then that pipeline might be built. Uh, I think that you know NASCAR is another sport that there's so much money involved. It's not a youth sport that's going to take off the way it did. But you know Michael Jordan buying a NASCAR team is a benchmark that's going to change NASCAR, I think, forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have those role models there that people can see. We now see, you know, black women and, and, and black men uh, on the leaderboards occasionally in golf. That's going to be important for young kids to see that, uh, that I can be like that person. Uh, we need those visual representations of who we can be uh, in order for us to even start the dream and participate in how to get there. Yeah, that's really true. And I mean, for that great question, I mean, you think about how Tiger Woods changed golf big time. I mean, from everything from basic athleticism to, you know, people hitting the gym, getting bigger and stronger to the amount of money that he he brought the purses and how they increased to the amount of television to way he affected television ratings. I mean, it was night and day when he came on on the scene in, in such a strong way. And then when he left, we saw what happened. So uh, that is a, a tremendous example. Tiger Woods really did change the game, but they have more growing to do for sure. All right, let's move along. Here's another uh, question, an excellent one by Natalie Jenkins. Natalie, thank you. Uh, she says, you mentioned the athletes using their platform for change is making a big difference. Do you have um, one or two, like a male and a female athlete, uh, in your opinion, that they're, that are doing a great job now? And what actions are they taking to affect change? And then how can some of the other athletes follow uh, to uh, do what they're doing? Anybody in particular jump out at you? Well, you know, the good news is that there are so many more that I could mention. But for me, uh, the woman who jumps out is Maya Moore, who literally sacrificed two years of her WNBA career at the height mm -hmm. of her career to work on criminal justice reform and to get a particular prisoner freed from, uh, from confinement. You know, LeBron James has been consistent uh, since before uh, this all the athlete activism movement started. He's been speaking out, doing things in his community, like building the school in Akron. Uh, but the, you know, the, the the good news is that the entire Milwaukee Bucks team walked off, that never walked on the court that day um, in in Orlando in the bubble. And the better news is that an hour later, the NBA and the Players Association joined the Bucks. Yeah. This is a movement now among, among our athletes, the WNBA as well. A lot of people don't remember that the WNBA uh, was active in, after police shootings in 2014, before Colin Kaepernick ever took a knee. WNBA players were wearing shirts with the names of victims on it. Um, so, you know, we're building up this history. I think the, the fact is right now, it's never going to stop because these are athletes who all of their life have been asked simple questions. Are you going to get over your injury? Are you going to play on this weekend? Are we going to win a championship? Now they're being asked about income inequality, right. housing, health care, police brutality. They're being asked about serious substantive things, and it feels good. They're not being valued as, as unidimensional human beings, but multidimensional human beings 
nobody's going to want to let that go. They're going to stay active. Yeah, and that's interesting to hear you talk about that because I've been doing media training seminars for many years with Olympic athletes, uh, other professional athletes, uh, guys getting ready to go to the NFL Combine, getting them ready to uh, be able to hopefully message at a higher level. And I think now more than ever, Dr. Lapchik, um, when you go out to face the media, you need to be ready to answer more questions than just about you know, how training was going or how this is happening, what have you. But to be able to either redirect or pivot to communicate about the moment we're in, right? Talk about, you know, how it's affecting you, your family. Uh, how, how is sports a part of this story that you're living or not? How are you really feeling deep down inside? I think, I think our, our country is ready now to hear more of the truth from these athletes who we now watch to, you know, give us the a joy and inspiration on the field of play. So the messaging that athletes are doing now is so vitally important. And it doesn't have to be just LeBron James or, the, or, the, or Maya Moore, as you mentioned. It's everybody. All the athletes competing in all the sports across uh, collegiate and high school sports, they have an opportunity now to speak their truth and tell their story. That's what I love about the games, telling the story. And now we have a chance really to do more of that in a more meaningful way that hopefully people will be listening and maybe change some hearts. All right, so uh, here's another question by someone I think you may know, Brian Reynolds, you know him? Um, he says that you are one of the role models at DFW nonprofit Trey Athletes. Um, and his question is, more than half of all D1 collegiate football and basketball players are black. And currently almost half of these athletes are not graduating from college. The question is, how can we rethink the college athletes experience to emphasize education and professional development? It's a great question. It is a great question. Um, I'm happy to, to share though that the graduation rates of Black student athletes in basketball and football have gone up dramatically in the past couple of years. The problem, because we report graduation rates of bowl bound teams as well as the teams that are playing in the men's and women's basketball tournament. So I'm familiar with them uh, on an annual basis. But the, the problem area is that the disparity between the graduation rate of white student athletes on those teams and black student athletes on those teams is way too big. It's close to, still close to 20%. Uh, for male student athletes, it's about, it's much better for females. It's about seven or 8%, uh, but the gap is still there. And we have to commit more resources in our athletic departments to make sure one, that we're admitting people who can be successful in our, in our colleges and universities. Uh, and two, that if they're a little below the standards that are usually applied to somebody we admit, and we admit people for dip, not just sports under those standards who show gifts in music or the arts or any some other fields, make sure we have the resources there to bring them up to the level of the student body in general so that they can not only compete on the football field and on the basketball court, but they can compete in the classroom and walk across that stage together four years later with that degree or whenever they get that degree. Very good. Yeah. Um, you know, being around collegiate sports, you always wonder about that element. Some, some are really doing well with the ad graduation rates, but some still struggle, but it has to be the focus for sure. Okay. Here's another question by Amanda Ekeber. Let me just tell you how much I'm enjoying this small font that I'm trying to read here. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad it says, hey, not me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it says, Hey, uh, hi, Dr. Lapchik. Thank you for speaking at the Atlantic 10 commission on racial equity diversity and inclusion. Um, they're hosting the uh, Rooney Rule event tomorrow that will be interviewing Jim Rooney, Dan Rooney's son, and the effectiveness of the Rooney Rule. I know you touched a bit on it, uh, but can you share more on what you would like to see in order for us to ensure that we are hiring minority candidates in the NFL and other areas, and what questions would have, you would have pertaining to the Rooney Rule? Well, originally, again, as we said earlier, the Rooney Rule required one person of color as a candidate for a head coaching job. Um, they have now extended it to include offensive and defensive coordinators, which was imperative because that's generally the pipeline, to the head coaching position to quarterback coaches, because that's another key position now. Uh, the Rooney Rule applies. It's now more than one candidate. It's not only candidate comes from inside your organization, you also have to bring somebody from outside the organization to make sure it's an above the board hiring practice. Um, to uh, get those young coaches known, Bill Walsh did this with the, with the 49ers for many years. When he was the coach, he would 
he would bring young coaches together and meet, have them meet other head coaches. So the head coaches were familiar with them by name and face, facial recognition. And when they were hiring an assistant coach or a coordinator, they knew that they could turn to some of those uh, people that Bill Walsh had introduced them to. We need more of that. We need coaches to establish what we call coaching trees um, to, to help elevate people who work for them to, to be in yeah. positions that they're going to get those head coaching jobs. Yeah, that, that is for sure. And I have had the good fortune to work around and cover so many great coaches uh, in college basketball or football. And you do see some great assistants who do move on. Then you see some that you're not quite sure why they're not getting those opportunities. So work still needs to be done there. All right. So this is a great question I just got. Um, and this is something that is going to be front and center as we maybe get things back into some sort of a normal mode post COVID. But as the collegiate sports move to as collegiate sports moves closer and closer to athletes receiving compensation for their physical contribution, of course, and their risk, how do you see this impacting uh, racial plight? So those who are coming into the game of college basketball or football, maybe from a very difficult background where their play, their prowess, their ability might change the generations in, behind or in front of them. What's going to happen when now compensation comes in for some of these players uh, for their likeness uh, on a collegiate football or basketball field? Well, first of all, I think we have to understand that that's going to be a very limited number of people who are going to get that compensation. Uh, but for those who do, I, I have, I can't remember any athlete who didn't at the first point of earning in a substantial income of any kind, talk about helping their mother out or helping their family out. Mm -hmm. It's never been about what I'm going to do. They might do some things for themselves, but the, their frame of mind is always to reach back and elevate the people who helped them to get where they were. So as those that young athletes get more money and more possibilities, I think that's what we're going to see. Yeah. We're going to see money being infused into black communities where they came from, uh, specifically with their families, but maybe as they earn even more money, uh, later in life, once they feel how good it feels to give it back uh, to, you know, maybe nobody's, nobody might or many might not do what LeBron James did in creating a school, but there are steps short of creating a school that you yeah. can make a great contribution uh, to ensure that the educational attainment of young people in the community is elevated from where it is today. I was having a conversation with some people um, right after COVID really was kind of more pronounced, maybe a couple of, men, uh, couple of months into this uh, pandemic. And the discussion was how has the pandemic affected not just sports, but if we talk about collegiate sports, but affected athletes of color who have been for maybe a generation or two living in difficult situations. Now the truth of their life is now becoming, is impacting them in a greater way because of the maybe disadvantages in healthcare because of maybe where you grew up and all those types of things which then affect the health of a parent or a grandparent or maybe themselves. Now you get COVID and you're at a greater risk to uh, maybe become sick or die. How do you see the um, intersection of COVID, race relations, and all these things you're talking about in this moment we're living right now? Well, it's not only, you know, for those who directly contracted COVID, Long term, we still don't know what the, those long term effects might be a year from now. Uh, but, you know, so many young people have had their, who are counting on a professional career. This isn't everybody. A lot of people play sport for the, the love of sport at the college level. But those who are counting on a professional career have at least had that deferred for a year. And sometimes when that happens and you come back, and we've seen it, examples of it in college sport football already, and you're more prone to get injuries because you're not as in, in as good a shape as you would have been. Had you've been training all this time leading up to it. So you might have a career ending or altering injury. Uh, you're going to have that year separating uh, people, you, you from the development of, of players uh, who are ahead of you. Uh, there are all kinds of consequences like that, but in the black community itself and communities of color, you know, we, we hear about this so often uh, since, co since the breakout of COVID and are paying attention to it that black people are two times as likely to get it, three times as likely to die from it. Brown people are two and a half times as likely to get it, two and a half times as likely to die. Indigenous people are five times as likely to get it and five times as likely to die from it. You know, this is all part of the systemic racism in the United States. 
that when people who come from communities of color go to their healthcare providers and in those communities, they're underfunded, they don't have the equipment, they don't have the, the uh, medicine that's sometimes necessary to help people through whatever crisis they're facing. They have maybe doc, uh, a shortage of doctors and nurses in those facilities, and they're gonna get lesser quality care, and that's therefore the result of getting a critical disease is more impactful on, on people of color just to get it because your chance of recovering from it is significantly less than if you were white. Absolutely. Um, your program that you teach there, as you continue to navigate all this information and data that you put out to all of us across the country, um, are there any other programs like yours that are teaching uh, what you're teaching and, and preparing people to be aware of these situations within the sports and, and uh, professional collegiate sports world across the uh, other uh, areas that, that you want to affect? Anybody else doing this? So we could we want to know if there are more, you know, disciples, if that's the word I can use, that are implementing these ideas and philosophies to help make change for the good for everyone. So I decided to do this. I loved what I was doing for Northeastern University at the Center for the Study of Sport and Society, um, which was more activist than it sounds. It sounds like it was a research group. It was really an activist group of athletes. Um, but when when I looked into what sports management programs were doing in the country. There were 67 at the time. None taught diversity, two taught ethics, one taught leadership, nobody emphasized service to the community. Uh, I looked at the student bodies of those, those uh, sports pro management programs. And now, because we were then 13 years into the racial and gender report card, I knew there were uh, leagues and teams that wanted to hire more women and people of color. But when I looked at the student bodies, there were 6% students of color, 20% women, 20% former student athletes. So I went to the president of UCF as he was asking me to advise him on creating this program, not thinking of, I wasn't thinking of myself as going to it and said all those things. If you make those your four pillars and if you recruit uh, students of color, women and former student athletes, you're gonna have a unique program here. So we've had in 20 years, 45% of our students have been students of color, 60% have been women. 60% have been former student athletes and they get jobs because the industry actually is looking for them and they get good jobs. Now you can imagine the demand they're in because we're the only program in the country that emphasizes diversity and inclusion. So suddenly in the racial reckoning, everybody wants what we do. And you know, I've been approached by not only athletic departments and conferences, but uh, sports management departments of what they can do to, to replicate some of these things. So hopefully that'll change in the future. But right now we are, even though there are now 250 graduate programs in the country, I think we're still quite unique. Our students do 21 hours of service a semester for a Central Florida agency serving underserved youth. That may sound like a random number, but if you multiply 21 by the two semesters, it's Jackie Robinson's number 42. <laughs> they spend a week before the year starts doing service. We've been doing it in New Orleans, rebuilding homes since Hurricane Katrina. Had, didn't, weren't able to do it there this year because of COVID. We focused on Orlando and Central Florida, but we've been there 58 times in, in New Orleans. We worked on 158 homes during that, that period of time. So by the time our students get into class, we've worked shoulder to shoulder. We've sweated on each other. They've seen paint on my face and, and mud in my wife's hair. Uh, and they get into that first class and they're brothers and sisters. They're not Hey, I'm Jack from wherever. I'm, you know, Alicia from wherever. They they've lived together and worked together, and done something really important together. Dr. Lapchick, it is amazing what we can accomplish uh, when we stand together. Right, no matter what we look like, where we're from, what religion you practice or not, if we can stand together in our humanity, in our humanity, what we can accomplish, and I hope that that is where we're going as a nation. But for sure. Today's conversation has been something that has been tremendous for all of us. And of course, it's been an honor for me to help lead this discussion. You have done some incredible things in your life and uh, the storytelling and the action steps that you've offered today to everyone, I hope will inspire them to take them back to their organizations, whether it be sports or the corporate world, and just to implement those things for the betterment of everyone. So I want to thank you so much for the time. It's been an honor again to be a part of this. Uh, and at that, with that, I'm going to throw it back to Kern. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, you're a tremendous facilitator of this important discussion as expected. We couldn't have asked for anybody to have helped us uh, in a better way than you. So thank you uh, very much for that. Dr. Lapchick, as always, 
Uh, wonderful to see you. Uh, I feel like I've heard your story a number of times, but it still is uh, it's just as much of a, an impact on me the, the fifth time I hear it as, as the first. And uh, all I can say is that we need more people like you. And I hope that this discussion uh, helps create more people that think like you and act like you and, and have the same goals uh, that you do. And thank you for shedding light on all that you've done for this important topic and the things that we might be able to start doing. You know, one thing we're really focused on is action instead of just talking. And I think that's why, Lauren, I think you put in the chat uh, where our website is, DFW United Sports in, in Action. Uh, we want to try to, to make change, not just talk about it. And uh, you've done a lot to help us today. So thank you, Dr. Lapchik, as always. Um, thank you to everybody who attended uh, this today with us and, and joined us for this important discussion. Uh, we've got one more. Uh, of this series of webinars. It's with Kim Davis, NHL Executive Vice President and hosted by our own Gail O'Bannon of the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, we'll be right back here, uh, same time on Wednesday, uh, October 28th. Don't forget to check out our website again and see what action uh, you can take to help be part of this movement and be part of uh, affecting the change that we all want and, uh, and need uh, in our society and in sports. So thank you again, everybody, for your participation and your involvement. and. Uh, you know, let's try to start with DFW and making us a better place and, and see how we can't make, uh, make a great example of the things that we might be able to do in this sports community for others around the country. So thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.